All right. Um, well, my name is Rahul Maitra. Sorry for the insane light. <laughs> it's just the time of the year, I guess. Um, I'm a CPA. I live in Virginia. And I'm given this presentation. This is really an introduction. Really, this the, the whole world of trusts and all that stuff um, gets very deep and they have... Um, there's a lot to learn if you wanted to really um, pull back the veil, uh, but this is really an introduction to it. And uh, the starting point of all of this, just in case you were wondering, is the whole point of this, like why would you even do any of this? Why bother? Uh, this is really for passing on assets and um, this is really for passing on assets to the next generation. There's a lot of people that are going to be passing on assets. People like just think of your parents. I'm 41. My dad is um, my dad's 82. My mom's, you know, a few years younger than him. Uh, and there's lots of people who've got parents um, who are old, you know, and all, everyone is going to be really uh, having to sort of deal with this issue. Um, okay. And here, let me just start the slideshow. Okay. So this is really about transferring assets. And this is the entry point because, um, a little revocable, uh, living trust is, um, just in case you didn't know, trusts are pretty amazing. Uh, it's a vehicle that's, uh, they have two types. There's called a, well, there's more than uh, two types, but the two main types are a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust. Uh, irrevocable trust is, and I'm not going over that this time, and I'll go over that some other time. But basically, once you create it, you can't change it. And you don't have control of, it's a separate entity. It's literally like a separate um, organization that has its own tax return. And you're not in control. There's a, uh, a trustee. There's three main people. You can think of it. Think of a triangle. You have the trustor, the person creating the trust. The person putting all the stuff into it. You have the trustee who's managing the trust. They're the one who actually have the control, ultimately. And the uh, the trustor, by the way, they're writing up the provisions for the whole trust, but the trustee is the one executing that. They're the one in this administrative role. And then you have the beneficiaries, the people who are getting the, um, the benefits from the trust itself. That could be payouts, that could be assets. Um, and so a revocable trust is something that you can change throughout the course of your life. And this is really the starting point. Most people really don't go into these other, uh, don't make an irrevocable trust, but um, this is really a relevant thing. And the notable case study that some people might have heard of is uh, the Rockefellers. The Rockefeller family is a very wealthy family, very renowned family. And the reason that they they basically, one of the things they did is they created this revocable trust. Their trust lasted many, many years. It didn't just stop and dissolve when uh, someone, you know, when the first person who made it died, they had it going for hundreds of years. And they would literally pair a, the trust with life insurance and put life insurance on all the different people in the family. And the, those life insurance policies would pay out into the trust. And um, they were able to transfer. There's tax benefits and all these things. I'll go into all that at a later time. And if you guys are interested, you know, please join. Okay. So the first question is, what compromises? What comprises the the estate? And so your estate. You talk about trusts, estate planning. What is an estate? Let's just start at the very base level. An estate is your stuff. All the things you own, that could be titled assets, cars, vehicles, things you literally are going to the DMV 
and registering and you're getting a personal property tax, you're getting taxed on those things, personal property tax. This, this can be trailers, farm equipment, uh, excavators, boats, motorcycles, cars, vehicles, that sort of thing. You have deeded assets, real estate, land, rental properties, buildings, that sort of thing. You have your checking and savings account, CDs, money markets, any of these sort of accounts. This is another class of uh, an item, of, you know, stuff, to use a, <laughs> a very simple term. And then you have um, other investments that you might have. Businesses, too. Businesses count. That is a thing. Capital assets. Life insurance, like I mentioned earlier, life insurance is a uh, is a vehicle of uh, it's an investment vehicle type. It's different from a CD. It's different from a money market. Life insurance is actually the oldest. Life insurance has been around since uh, I think the Roman times. Uh, it's been around a very long time. And then you have your all your personal things, furniture, uh, art, you know. Um, Anything like that, personal property, your easy bake oven, you know, <laughs> it, it could be all kinds of different things. No matter how large or small, everyone's got one. So that's what an estate is. Okay, so what are the core documents we're talking about? When your friend mentioned all this, Kathy, what were they referring to? Well, you have the the centerpiece document, the revocable living trust, uh, and this is, uh, and I'll, I'll go into the definition of what that is, but this is a private document. This is a document not accessible to the public, but this is essentially stating your intentions and wishes, and it's a contract, and it's, it's, uh, it's basically putting your intentions for passing on your estate into a contract. But this is private and no one's gonna be able to look at that and read that except for the people you wish to involve. We talked about those three important people, the person creating the trust, the trustee, the beneficiaries. Uh, the beneficiaries, they might not even see this document if you really didn't want them to, but the trustee and the trustor are definitely gonna see it but it's not in the public domain. You also have the uh, certificate of trust. Now, this is gonna be the document that you can present to the court, that you're pre presenting to the bank. And the certificate of trust is essentially proving that there is a trust, that there is a, um, that it, it's there in place. And that's the thing that you can you're presenting. And so this is the public document that's informing the uh, different parties that a trust exists. You have the last will and testament. Now most people have just heard of the their their will. Oh, you got to get a will done. Now the last will and testament is a it's really a wish list. Now if you don't have a trust set up in any way and you just have the will. That is still valuable, but ultimately it is something that the judge has to rule on. Yes, you're stating your intentions, just like the living revocable trust is you stating your intentions, but the living revocable trust is a contract. The last will is not considered a contract, and thus the judge has to rule on that. And it's something that you're ultimately since you have to present it to a judge, it is in the public sphere. And you'll see this term pour over will. Well, when you have a living revocable trust, um, let me give you guys an analogy. Imagine your estate, all the stuff you have are things that you're putting inside um, a briefcase. Let's say you're going to travel on a trip. You're putting these things inside a briefcase to take with you. That's what the living revocable trust is. And I'll go into um, how that sort of works. But when you fund 
fund the trust, you're putting your things into the trust. Now, maybe you created the trust when you're 40 or 50 or something, and you're living till you're 70, 80, 90, 100. You know, you create it at some point in your life, and uh, you'll have other assets that you acquire. And maybe you didn't put that in the trust itself. And I'll explain what I'm talking about when I say put that in the trust. I want to be very specific about all these terms I'm using. But if you didn't put something in that suitcase and you go travel to Europe, and let's say you left some clothes, some underwear, something like that at home, well, the pour over will is basically a public document that you're presenting to the judge saying, hey, Everything that we did not expressly mention in the trust itself, we're pointing to the trust. We have this trust. Treat all our other stuff like you would everything mentioned in the trust. And we're going to, you know, um, distribute those things according to what the trust is saying. So that's what the poor, that's why they call it a pour over will, because everything else. You're just pouring back into the trust, and it's a it's like the public document that will state that. Okay, the other three things. Now, the last three I'm going to show here are the durable power of attorney over finances, durable power of attorney over health care, and the advanced medical directives, also known as a living will. Now, these three items are when you're still living, but you're incapacitated. God forbid something happens to you if you're unable to uh, administer your estate and take care of those things, you're essentially appointing a person to do that for you in the realm of finances, in the realm of health care. So that's what these two things are. And then you might wonder, well, okay, well, if you already have a durable power of attorney over health care, why even, why is there a living will at all? or advanced medical directives. Well, you know, people have all kinds of different situations. Someone can be living, um, you know, let's say it's, you know, parents or something. The parents may be living in Nebraska, but their kids live in New York. And you just can't get a hold of the son who has the durable power of attorney over healthcare and finances. Well, this advanced medical directives, your living will, this is a document you can keep in your purse. This is a document you can keep in your glove compartment. And actually, um, people who are first responders, they're trained to look for these kind of documents. Because when you first go to the hospital, they're going to want to have that. They're going to ask you, they're going to ask whoever they can. They're going to try to find someone who's connected to you. And they're going to It'll have basically information about, do you want to be fed through a feeding tube? Do you want to be put on a respirator? It gets really specific. Organ donation, all of those different things. It's not just, you know, the back of your driver's license. You can state your wishes for when you're, you know, in a, if you're in a coma, if, you know, all these different things. So anyways, that's the thing that you're like giving to the hospital right then and there on the moment. And so that's something that you want to keep keep on you in some way. Keep in your purse, keep in your driver's license, even fold it up, you know, put it in your wallet if that's the case. Um, okay, so the next step is understanding that everyone, there's already a default plan for all of this stuff. Because there has to be, because people are in this world and, you know, people pass away. And so the government has set up a plan, a, the default plan, which is called probate. And it goes to essentially probate court. Now, so let's say that you have absolutely nothing set in place. You don't have a will. You don't have... Uh, a trust or anything set up, then it will go to probate court. And I'm going to describe, we're going to go into what that is, what pro, the whole probate process we're going to go through in the next step. 
also, but if you have the will, the last will and testament, you've stated your intentions, but again, the judge is going to rule on that and is going to ultimately be the um, the one who makes that decision. And th these, you know, this is again public realm, so people can contest this. You know, if you have, let's say, you make your wishes stated in this will. Your kids, let's say you have a bunch of kids. Let's say the family doesn't get along. This happens a lot. There's a lot of people whose families aren't, you know, super cohesive. And there's infighting and disagreements. And since it's in the public realm, you know, a child who, or so one of the kids, one of the, you know, uh, people who are the, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, these are adults. I mean, I'm calling them kids, but the children of the people who are uh, passed away, they can contest that in court. They can say, hey, this is unfair. And since, in, since it's in court, it'll play out. They'll be heard. Um, and then you might be wondering, well, why is... And then the third one is an unfunded living revocable trust. So... A living revocable trust is a contract. It's paperwork. It's literally paperwork that you're getting executed, which means getting it notarized with some witnesses. But there's more than that. This just creates the 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 trust itself, but you have to actually put your estate into the name of the trust. Now, like the legal name that you're putting it in would be like for me, it would be Rahul Maitra, trustee of the uh, Maitra Family Trust. And so those deeded properties, your land, your home, your your name right now, if you've done nothing and you have a home, your name is on that deed. Well, you need to go to... <laughs> Basically, you know, get that amended so that the trust itself, your name as the trustee for this trust is on the deed. You've got to go to the DMV and put the, your name on the title. In addition, you can add your name for like a title. You can add your name. You don't have to, you know, replace it, but you're adding your name in, you know, as the trustee of this trust. And then bank accounts, too. So if you forget to do that last critical step, because when you go to an attorney and they draw up documents, they're not going to do that last step. And what's insane is that I think it's like 80% of people that go and make this trust, go to an attorney or something, get this paperwork done, even get it executed. Don't do that last step. And, um, Basically, since they're not in the name of the trust, it still has to go to probate. It's still, and then it goes to the public realm for those particular things. Okay. And then the other plan is where you're doing something with intentionality. And that's why I call it a properly funded living revocable trust, because you're putting those things, the deeded properties, the titled properties, the bank accounts into the proper naming, you know, this person, trustee of this trust. And a, and just to reiterate, it is a contract documenting your intent, and it creates a management structure by which you own assets, and those assets can be managed or controlled on your behalf when you're incapable of doing so. So let's go into what the probate process itself looks like. So the first step is when it first, uh, when all of this happens, when you pass away, die, when your parent passes away or dies, a formal petition for probate is filed in probate court. There's a fee with that. Now, if you have a will, in that will, you can name a personal representative. This is like the trustee. 
you're naming the person who's going to do the legwork of, you know, all of this stuff. Um, you know, give me one second, guys. Let me just turn on some lights here. Okay. The sun's going down. All right. So you can name that personal representative responsible for this whole process. If uh, Now, the family can also hire a legal representative to manage the process if they don't want. It's actually a lot of work, and I'm going to go into what the responsibilities are of this personal res uh, representative or the trustee. The trustee is going to have to do this stuff, by the way. Um, whether you have a trust or you don't, someone has to do these things. And some people will hire a legal representative to do this because it's a it can be a lot of work, um, and that maybe they have to work full time. You know, they're a working class person and they just can't get away and do all these different things. And if you don't have a will at all, the court will appoint someone, a representative, to oversee the process, and that cost is going to be paid out of the estate itself. And so the next thing is you're notifying everyone in the form of certificates and notifications. Certificates are cheaper. They can be, you know, maybe up to 20 bucks a piece. Notifications cost up to $300. And these are prices that are, you know, that vary depending where you are in the country. Now the notifications are going to beneficiaries and heirs and to creditors and these certificates are going to everyone else every single bank account every single so you know so instead of a uh essentially well i'll go into the process if you have a trust set up but if you don't have any trust contract set up you're sending these certificates out to everyone whether it's you know their utility bill their all their different banks and stuff, you know, their internet bill, every person that is sort of tied to this person in any way, uh, contractually, that they have services with. So everyone's notified of the death. So this first step is just, hey, this person passed away. It's it's notifying of that, and um. It's got to be served to everyone named in the will, if there is a will as well. So those are the those more expensive notifications. Um, if there is no will, it must be served. So basically, they've got to look into uh, what's called the interstate, not interstate, but interstate heirs. It's a legal term. Uh, and they're going to see who are the living descendants of this person. And it has to be served to all those people. Um, and different jurisdictions might require more stuff, by the way. There might be more procedures than this. It goes state by state. Okay, so the personal representative, and this can be, and also the trustee for the estate, by the way, they've got to do all these different things here. They've got to catalog all of the property that's in that estate real estate property and personal property titled deeded bank accounts and all of their stuff all of their stuff they've got to pay any debts or claims or taxes that are due so if these this person owes any money they've got to pay that out they've got to if there's if they're if they have any royalties or dividends the rights to any income, um, they've got to collect all of that stuff up. They've got to settle any disputes, financial property disputes. They've got to deal with all those things. They've got to file that final tax return for the person once they pass away. If this person is very wealthy uh, and over you know, a certain dollar number, they're going to have to file an estate tax return. If there's no, um, you know, if they're passing it on, if you're just passing things on to your child, you know, the government <laughs> takes a sizable amount. If you're, you know, if you own 
more than a certain number of assets. And that's in, you know, over a million dollars, that sort of thing. You've got to also prepare the uh, the state taxes and expenses. So basically, there's accounting that needs to be done for that. If there's a state tax that needs to be paid. Uh, if there's creditors that are um, making more claims, once the person is dead, you know, these creditors have a certain window of time to make claims to the court. And you've got to deal with that. Litigating means, you know, dealing with it in uh, in court. You've also got to distribute all those assets. If they have the will or if they don't, you've still got to distribute all the stuff they have. That includes their furniture and, you know, things that have sentimental value, personal things, and the deeded and trust uh, entitled assets as well. And sometimes, uh, depending on the state, they have to basically post a bond to serve. They, there's a cost associated with being this person. And uh, if that person doesn't have you know, a good credit score, maybe the bond is worth more. So anyways, that's if it goes to court. Again, the, person, the uh, public realm. Okay, so continuing. So once they do pick this personal representative and they're appointed, and they could people could challenge that as well. That's another problem. Since all this is in the public realm, um, it is up to challenge. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, once that person's appointed, there's another document that's being sent out to everyone. It's called a testamentary letter um, to the personal representative. And basically, this document is empowering the personal representative to enforce the terms of the will when dealing with banks or real estate agents or anyone else requiring proof before they cooperate with this person. Because how are they going to, you know, and, and just think about it. Logistically, you have this person saying, oh, this person died. I'm their representative. They're going to want proof. That's what this document is, this testamentary letter. And it gives the court authority on to act on behalf of the person's estate. So after that's appointed, they got to serve notice to all the people, just like they did in that first step, serving notice that this person passed away. And remember, it's taking time to, it takes time to appoint this representative. You know, these things, I'll go into that uh, in the next slide here, but um, there's a whole time element to this that you got to keep in, uh, <laughs> you, you got to keep in mind. So anyways, all the people you're serving notice to, um, including the predators and the descendants, and it could vary from state to state, but basically these predators have time, like I was saying before, to respond and to make a claim. And after that, there's a period that passes and then their claims are dropped. And then they also have to basically get uh, appraisals. They've got to remember they're categor they're cat cataloging all the stuff you have. Well, they need to basically file an inventory of all of these things, and that includes appraising vehicles, homes, personal effects, jewelry, all the, all that antiques, all that kind of stuff. And then there's the whole time burden element of it as well, and the fact that it's public. So it is very detail-oriented, this probate process. It's very time-consuming, and it's stressful. Um, I have a lot of like older friends in the area here uh, that are in their late 70s, mid-70s, um, and they've told me, uh, my friend Alan, who lives you know, down the road, Scott, um, he was telling me how he had to do this for his mom. His mom lived up in New York, and it took him 18 months to go through this process. And if someone's taken on that responsibility, another client, a tax client, and his wife had to do this process. And she was literally making phone calls all day long for months and months and months. And it can really become a job. It's just a, a lot of work. Um, if you're 
Uh, and also, you know, we'll talk about this, but the trustee, they're essentially going to do these things too. Now, it's easier if you don't have to report everything back to the judge, report everything back to the court. It's much easier, but you still have to do the, all these things. It's a major responsibility that you, you know, you have to pick someone. Um, and as a result, a lot of people face the reality of hiring someone to administer uh, through this process and the fees have to be paid out through the estate and let's just talk about that for a second i know people um my friend alan for example you know he's got a uh like a half brother or a half and a half sister but he doesn't trust them you know some families are more fractured than others and there's you know there's an element of trust and relying on someone. And just think about all these tasks we just described here, by the way, doing tax returns, you know, contacting all these institutions and banks and uh, no, you know, notifying all these people, maybe doing litigation, do, dealing with the law side of it, having to litigate creditors, you know, these are like big, big roles. And let's say you just don't know anyone in your life that can do this well you can they have trust departments and banks that do this um as well but that's for the trust but you know just think about it uh in the public in the public realm if you don't have a trust or anything i mean you've got to hire someone to do that in this case and i'm not uh, exactly sure who does that in the case of if you're just going through the probate process and um can't rely on that personal representative. Um, and again, this is all open up to the public. The court system, it has to be public because it's like the government, it's where the government meets your personal life. And because of that, it is a public thing and uh, the world can see that. And that's where a lot of this scammer stuff kind of comes as well. There are people out there that are just looking at the public record, that are seeing what's new and what's out there. If someone died, if someone got arrested, and they're, you know, they might act on that in some way. So that's another reason why you don't want all this to be in the public sphere. Okay, so having your own plan and the trust in this case the living revocable trust bypasses the government's plan now the probate court is designed to do these different things here designed to pay outstanding debts designed to make sure that final tax income tax returns done um, and that everyone's paid out and that all the stuff's distributed and if there's children aside guardians for minors or if there's disabled children or disabled adults. Let's say you have someone with Down syndrome and they're an adult and you just got to take care of them. They're not a child, but they, you know, you are their guardian. And when you pass away, someone needs to be their guardian. And then distributing the estate, you know, by the uh, way the will is uh, dictating or according to the laws of interstate, uh, if you have no will at all. So these are the things the probate court has to do. And essentially, how does having a living trust bypass this? Well, basically, they're doing the things that the probate court is you know, normally having to do. But there's a big difference. The will is just a wish list. It's not a contract, and it's still subject to probate. The trust, though, is legal. It's a legal contract where that individual or that married couple they're deciding how they want their estate settled who gets what when how we'll go into all of that stuff um, shortly but basically this document's executed which means it's signed in front of a notary in front of witnesses and um, it basically <coughs> it accomplishes uh, what the probate process is responsible for so that's how it's bypassing all these things, by the way. And um, 
so basically you have a lot more control by the way you can do all kinds of things that the court can't necessarily or can't do um there's all these different provisions that you could put in to perfect your, uh, pr protect your beneficiaries uh, as well as the successor trustee the successor trustee is like this the role of the personal representative um uh, let's look into what some of those things are okay so they have what's called spendthrift provisions uh if you have younger children first off they have what's called joint trusts if you have young kids if your kids are really young when you pass away well you can uh through these spendthrift provisions you can make it so they're getting their money in stages they're getting you know a chunk of money when they're 18 a chunk of money when they're 25 a chunk of money when they're 30 um there's all kinds of provisions let's say you know one of the people in your family is uh addicted to drugs or something well you know one of your kids is addicted to drugs you could put in the provisions that they can't receive their you know um what they're entitled to for the estate until they uh get clean you know and don't do drugs um there's lots of lots of different provisions like that um also <laughs> let's say you're like extremely wealthy right uh and you wanted to have a plan in place like what the rockefeller family would do is that instead of having a bunch of kids that were just living off of this trust and not having to work a day in their life you could put other provisions in you could say well the the uh trust will match you know what your earned income is so if you're earning money the trust will also give you that amount of money per year or the trust will match whatever you're putting in uh for let's say you want to buy a home there's provisions you can put in where if someone's trying to buy a home the amount of money they put in for their down payment the trust can match that so there's all these other things or in the, in the case of the rockefellers they can basically put provisions in what they did was provisions where you have to manage the foundation created by uh you know their affiliated family foundation and they have to manage that in order to earn their um their their portion of the uh you know what they'd earn from the trust uh, another thing is you'll be able to keep making changes to this over time, over and over and over as life dictate, you know, as the circumstances of life dictate, you can basically, you might create this at whatever age you're at and you can change this over time. Um, and it'll be exactly the way you want it. That's the beauty of it. Okay. Now, ultimately having your own plan is your choice and the way you know um you might be asked what's the best time to do this estate plan uh the answer is now <laughs> right or, or sooner rather than later there's really no reason not to have something like this set in place because especially if it's a, a revocable living trust and by the way the term revocable living trust living revoke these are you know i've seen it written both ways but it's good to have it done right away because you can change that over time and you're setting in you, you never know how you might you know what life will throw out you know throw at you if you, you know you can there's just if you're driving in cars there's just so many different ways accidents can happen and you got to just account for it um, okay, so how can you actually create the uh, estate? So you can um, basically go to an attorney. Traditionally, um, this was the original way of doing it. You'd have to go to an estate planning attorney, draft the documents. And by the way, the estate planning attorney, they're just using software to do this. No one is drafting up most of the documents when it comes to titles and you know, all of these different things. Attorneys are using software with templates and, you know, customizing it based on what you're, they'll ask you a questionnaire 
they'll customize it to base you know to to how you are uh, what you're answering in that questionnaire essentially. And uh, estate planning attorneys, they're uh, you know they uh, attorneys like to charge by hour typically. You can check in your area. You can call them. Just ask them, hey, what would it cost to do this? You can get the prices. You can see what it is. Um, but typically, it's uh, several thousand dollars, maybe four thousand, five thousand. I don't know what it might be in wh whatever area you guys are in. Um, and that's going to be just that one draft, by the way. If you're going to change that, you know, you've got to go back to them and it'll cost more. Um, if you go through the attorney route, if you look online, there's also do it yourself estate planning software that you have to do it all by yourself. I got one of these. I remember, uh, Susie Orman, you know, she had, uh, I forget what it was. She, she was like, Hey, if you get this DVD, it comes with, uh, a, a living revocable trust template that you could fill out, um, now again, these softwares that they have, some of them are, you know, pretty uh, pretty inexpensive. But the problem is you're doing you're sort of doing it all by yourself, and you might want guidance. Uh, but that option is there too. And then if you had to, if you wanted any sort of specific, uh, I don't know how these things work with their provisions and all that stuff. I don't know if they have, you know, if you wanted specific stuff done. You know, this is all drafted, whether it's the estate planning attorney, uh, the do it yourself, all these documents in these softwares, they're all drafted by estate planning attorneys. So if you start modifying those documents in the do it yourself version, um, I just don't, you know, you're, you're, maybe it's not um, legally sound or something. There is that risk. Uh, and I don't really know exactly how those particular softwares work um but they exist and that's an option and it's your choice how uh which way you want to go and then they also um have like a, a guided estate plan with a fi financial professional basically what this is referring to for the whole process so uh in this process so i'm a cpa and there's people that have made uh software for attorneys now traditionally it's only been acts uh you know, marketed and uh, sold to attorneys. But now, essentially, they're expanding uh, the marketing of how they're doing it, and they're reaching out to other financial professionals, people that work in accounting, you know, uh, and know, understand taxes, uh, and also people in life insurance, other people in, like, the financial plan or financial planners, people who are licensed, um, and are in these other realms of finance, but not attorneys specifically. And the difference is, like uh, in the case with me, for example, I'm working with someone through the entire process, through the funding, the process, and then after that, even like you know, um, you know, for me, for example, I'm helping folks. You know, I'm that point of contact that all their kids and all the beneficiaries can go to. For their entire life attorneys most of the time they're not you know if you want their time they're you have to pay for it if you have if you want to make changes or any of that and i'll go into um so anyways there's different ways and you can get it uh, and i'll go into uh the difference um some of the differences in the the last slide okay so let's just look at the process of setting up um a living revocable trust and uh the timeline of completion. All right. So the very first step. So I do <laughs> living revocable trusts. And so if you were to do it with me, um, this is the way that I would approach. Uh, we'd go through the whole process. So the very first step is basically you've got to just gather a little bit of data about who those key people are. You've got to really, and this is really on you, on the client, um, on the person creating the trust, you got to figure out who those key people are. Who's going to be that successor trustee with all of those important responsibilities? Who can you rely on? You know, who's going to be the beneficiaries? You know, and then who's going to have that those power of attorney things? 
Now, this step doesn't take a long time, but you do have to really put some deep thought and intention behind this. These are going to be critical people, and you need to really rely on them. And if you don't have someone, you can go to banks, and they, a lot of banks have a trust department, and they will do this for you. They can be the one who administers the trust. That way you can have beneficiaries who maybe aren't, you know, uh, you can't rely on for this sort of stuff, but you could still give them your estate. You could pass on your estate to them. You could have someone manage it, but you got to figure out who that person is. Okay. And then the next step, once you know who those people are, um, and for me, I would basically walk you through this whole process. If you didn't take this webinar or whatever, uh, you know, I would essentially take, you know, a half hour or so and walk you through everything I'm showing in this whole webinar here. Um, so after you figure out who those people are, you go through and you create the trust documents and you're essentially every single provision, you know, you're, you're setting everything the exact way you'd want it. You're going through step by step and you're choosing all of those different things. And we're going to go into what those look like, but you're going to be creating the documents essentially according to the your exact um, wishes. And then the next is going to be executing the documents, which means now it's the, the, the requirements are different in every single state, but I believe the states are actually moving towards, you know, raising the standard to, to uh, and some of them don't require this. Some of them, you could just do it through a notary, but the highest level of standard, uh, the highest standard you could do is you get it notarized and there's two witnesses there and the witnesses cannot be named in the trust. And so that's what I would recommend either way. Um, it's just the best practices and no one's going to be mad at you if you're going above and beyond and, you know, getting two witnesses or something in your state, even though maybe it's not required in that state. So literally just going and getting these documents with the witnesses notarized not a big deal by the way easy stuff and then the next step would be auditing your assets and liabilities now keep in mind if you're going to an attorney to do this process uh you might have to do all of this all at once you know you might have to do all the thinking about who the key people are you've got to go through and really audit and do a financial fire drill of all your assets, all your titled assets, deeded things. What are your, you know, um, all your personal property, furniture, and all those things that mean mean things to you that have sentimental value. And then what are your liabilities? What are the debts you have? What do you have to pay off? You've got to account for all of that. So you really have to take some time and go through that stuff. And that's essentially the homework you would have after doing, you know, the different steps if you're working with me, for example. And then the next step after that, once you know all of your different assets and liabilities, you've got to, you'll have your trust documents created, you'll have them executed, and now you got to go through and put the things into the trust. If it's a deeded property. Um, now for me, we work with a third party um, called DeedWorks. DeedWorks, if... Now, some people are just, you know, let's say you're setting up a trust for your mom or something. They might, you know, they might be like 70 or 80 and be like, well, you know, I don't know about going to the courthouse and changing it myself. There's a company that can do that for you. It really doesn't cost that much money. I could go over exactly a full breakdown of what the costs are for that. But it's if you have them do every single thing for you, you know, if you don't have a copy of your deed, if you don't have, you know, uh, you know, and there's, I think every county will have certain fees associated with filing this. And, you know, if you want to know the exact breakdown, I could go through that with you. Um, and we can, if you're in a different state, we could look up what that is for you. But it's not going to be more than like a few hundred bucks to transfer the deed. Now, the other things, you got to go to the, D, the DMV for the titled assets and for the bank accounts. Yeah, you got to go on the phone. You got to get it changed into the name of the trust. But then when you're doing that, think about it. You have your whole life to 
do these things and you're not, you know, in probate court, you're doing it at a stressful time. And, the, you know, psychologists tell you, you don't want to make any big decisions within 12 months when you're in the grieving process. So imagine you're able to do this when you're not stressed out, when someone didn't die, when you're not grieving, and you're able to do all this um, ahead of time. That's the beauty of all this stuff. And and then understanding the roles of the key people. So that would be another follow-up call we would do. We would get, I think the best thing to do is really get all the beneficiaries, everyone in the family, and you first off, make them understand what that successor trustee is going to do. What What is settling, you know, the estate look like? What are all those steps? Make them Make everyone in the family know that, you know, bring them all on board. Now, I'm not talking about, um, and we'll go into this on a uh, later slide here. I'll basically go into each of these steps here in the later, in the next slides. But basically, you want to understand all of the roles of the key people involved here, of the trustee, of the beneficiaries, the power of attorney, like just explain that to everyone get this information, have that discussion, you know? And the goal for all this is getting it done in 60 days. And the biggest part of this, you know, creating the trust documents, that's quick. You can do that in an hour. I mean, if you want to really go through and, you know, look at all the different options, but it doesn't take that long at all. Getting the thing executed doesn't take long. It's a trip to, you know, the bank. You go to UVA Credit Union, if you have an account there, they'll notarize stuff for free. It's the funding of the trust that takes the most time, especially with, you know, transferring the deed into the, the name of the person. Um, let me see how we're doing on time, by the way. Oh, shoot. Okay, let me pick this up here. I'm sorry I'm running over, guys. Um, okay. That's the thing that takes the longest time. That's where people have the holdup. People just procrastinate. And they don't get around to it. And so it's important to have someone sort of put a fire under your butt and make you finish that last step. So the goal is to get all of this done in 60 days. Okay, so creating the trust documents. There's all these different provisions. I'm going to go through this a little bit faster just because I don't want to keep you guys. All right. So the standard trust is where you're just giving this, giving your stuff to, passing it on to your beneficiaries. Um, the old school way of doing it was the AB trust option. And what that is, and that still might be best if you have, let's say you got married more than once and you have kids from a first marriage and then you remarried. The AB trust lets you, you know, let's say the husband dies. He had a child from a previous marriage. Well, it splits into an A and a B. When the husband dies, it splits to A and the child from the first marriage is entitled to their things. But that B, trust B, that's still revocable because the wife, the surviving spouse is still living and their kids are still there. So that's revocable until she dies and then that locks into place, if you want it to be, by the way. And then their kids get um, their distribution. So that's what the A, B. And we can go into this uh, in more detail if you uh, if you guys want. And then they have the irrevocable option. Now, this is not, this doesn't make it an irrevocable trust. That's like a completely kind of different entity. The irrevocable option just makes it so that you can choose when you die, if you have your intentions that you're putting into this contract, that, that, inten that your intentions are locked in place and that a trustee and the beneficiaries can't change that. Or you can make it where it's not where they can change it. Again, your choice. Let's say you want to have a uh, IRA or some of these qualified plans, a 401k, dump into the trust, dump their, uh, you know, the beneficiary of that to be the trust. Well, you need to basically have certain, um, you can't be in control. Just like I was telling you before, the irrevocable trust, you're giving up a factor of control because you're not the trustee. Um, you're just the person creating the trust and there's a beneficiary and there's a separate trustee, but 
you're not that trustee, you're not in control. And if you want to have the IRA see through qualification, you have to give up that control. So um, we can go into that. You know, if you have questions about that, we can go into that some other time. And then you have, okay, if you, you know, prenuptial agreements, marriage contracts, you can actually set it up so the husband and the wife have separate property that stays separate and is looked at as separate during the trust. Or you can make it community property. You can join everything together. And then you can even have divorce pr provisions where if you're divorced, you can make the trust dissolve. You can make it so that the trust assets cannot be used to hurt the other person, the other person, you know, if two people are splitting, you one person of the split up can't use it against the other. The spendthrift provisions, again, you can, you know, figure, you can be, be very specific how you want that money to be doled out. If you want it to be over periods of time or you can do it all at once, whatever you want. Um, or you could do a yearly thing. Every year they get this amount of money. Um, and then the, again, provisions for minor children and then special needs are disabled. And let me just say something. I don't know if anyone in this particular thing, now I'm recording this. So maybe someone who's watching this in the future time might have this, but if you have a special needs or a disabled, um, child or an adult that you're the guardian of a lot of these uh, people are taking they're using basically uh, they're getting government benefits and those but government benefits require that they not have a certain amount of income now a lot of well-meaning people will um, give them money leave them money and all of a sudden they get this big chunk of money and they lose their benefits because you know, it goes against the government's uh, provision where you can't have a certain amount of money. So for that case, you have someone else who's sort of overseeing and taking care of that person and overseeing their money, the money that was given to them, but so that they're not losing their benefits. Okay. Uh, here's some other things. Uh, the beneficiaries, choosing the beneficiaries. If you want, you can... And you have to do that if you want to disinherit someone. Let's say you have three kids, but one of them's, I don't know, just like against the family or something. I mean, I don't even want to go into the dark <laughs> realms of what this could be. But uh, people have different families, all right? And sometimes you might need to disinherit someone. And in the case of the will, that person who's like, hey, I'm getting screwed on all this, they can contest that in court. You can't contest a trust contract in the same way you can't do it and if you specifically well you can to a little degree but if you put in a disinherit provision then it's like they can't do it because you've stated in there those things so it just makes it even more bulletproof again these are just options trustee selection you can make it so that you choose the first trustee and if you want this living revocable trust to live on for you know 50 years, 100 years, 300 years, you can make it so every, you pick the first one and every subsequent trustee has to be a um, fiduciary, uh, a lawyer, a CPA, uh, someone who has, or the trust department of a bank, someone who's a third party, but has, you know, <laughs> a license on the line and they're not going to do stupid stuff. And uh, again, it's not, you know, Uncle Ricky or whatever, uh, or whoever, you know, whomever might be a beneficiary. Uh, now, I was going to just say, the beneficiary can be the trustee. Let's say you just have one child. It's a parent. They want to pass their things on to their kids. They have a great relationship with their kids. They can make the kid or their grown-up child, you know, the trustee and the beneficiary. You can do that, too. You know, it doesn't have to be complicated. That's the beauty of this. This is, when I say this is estate planning 101, that's because, you know, you're talking about a 70-year, 80-year-old person. Most regular people, they don't need the bells and whistles. They just want to stay out of the probate process, stay out of that, and pass their things on. And that's what this is. That's why I literally call this 101, by the way. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can be simple. Simple is beautiful, too. There's nothing wrong with that. 
the financial power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, you have to choose all these people in the creating of the trust and the living wills, and you can get a lot more detailed than the back of your driver's license. All right, moving along here. All right. Executing and restating the trust documents. Okay, so first off, the highest standard that I would recommend, two witnesses and a notary, and the witnesses cannot be named in the trust. Okay, so that's one thing. Now, restating the trust documents, um, remember, if you're going to an attorney uh, and you're getting this done by an attorney, when would you have to go back to an attorney to change those particular documents? And when would you not have to? Uh, or when would you have to, And if you, or if you're just working with me, you could do it on limited times with no cost or whatever. Um, but sometimes you actually have to restate the actual um, revocable living trust documents and get it re-notarized. Again, not a big deal. You change it, you get it re-notarized, but you got to do the step of getting it re-notarized. They call it restating. Here's the things that require it. You change the state of residence. You change the provisions in the trust, you're adding kids, you're changing who you're distributing it to, adding, removing a beneficiary, changing the trustee, or you're adding, removing titled assets or deeded properties. You, you know, these things will require you to just redo the document. Again, not a big deal, getting it re-notarized. And the other things, remember, there were seven documents. The Living Revocable Trust was just one of them. So, again, before you execute them, you can change the trust options before executing them. So, of course, that doesn't require restatement. If you're changing the financial power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, that's a separate document. So you don't need to redo the trust, re-notarize the trust. Same with the advanced directives. It's a separate document. So you don't have to change the trust for that. And then for personal property, you don't have to change the trust for that. You, you can. There's a separate document where it, um, that the trust points to, but you can add to it over time. Because, you know, think about it. You can make it when you're 40 or 50. Over the years, you add get more stuff, you know? Okay. And then funding the trust. So this is transferring the stuff into the trust. Again, deeded properties. Think homes, real estate, land, you know, real estate, uh, rental properties, titled properties include vehicles, trailers, things you have to register at the DMV and you pay personal property tax for, farm equipment, boats, things that need a little license plate, you know, bank accounts, investment accounts, brokerage accounts, CDs. Insurance policies, that's another thing. Okay. <laughs> so let's just go into the responsibilities of that again. This is going to be like the uh, probate process, but settling the estate. So instead of this doing by a personal uh, representative, as mentioned in a will, the successor trustee is going to have to do all these critical, critical roles. Notify everyone in the family someone's passed away, give them copies of the death certificate. Um, businesses, if they're in a business, whoever might need that. Um, the trust document, you might be curious. You don't get a tax ID. You don't register an EIN number with the IRS until the death occurs. And that's when you go and do that. Um, and you set it up as a trust, a living revocable trust. But you don't get a tax ID. It's almost like a pass-through entity kind of thing, like an LLC. But you get that at the time of death. You notify all these agencies, banks, creditors, the post office, utilities, Social Security, the VA, if they're a veteran, um, insurance companies. Uh, getting things appraised, you know, determining the value of different things vehicles or um now this will all help by uh, bypass probate but there's still an element of basically you have to verify assets verify what's in the bank account verify you know 
maybe the blue book value of vehicles or something like that. But again, since you're just passing it on to the people in the estate, you're not having to go back to the court and report this stuff. You want to verify them. And there might be, you know, appraisal that you want to do if you're passing it on, stepping up the basis for properties and that sort of thing. Uh, you got And then you got to distribute all the stuff, everything outlined um, under the assignment of assets, pay off creditors. Again, still a thing you got to do mortgage, loans, credit cards, medical debts. You got to file that last tax return either yourself or get um, help, you know, from a CPA or whoever tax preparer. Um, and if there's estate taxes, you got to pay those. If there's um, basically um, a ton of, uh, if you have a lot of money, but if you're super super wealthy, then the other kind of trusts that might be something you want to do. But we can go into all that stuff later. But that's if you have like well over a million dollars. I think it's 14 million or something. It's a big number, you know. Uh, and then you got to distribute all the assets. All right. So what are some of the new uh, innovations in the field of trust? And basically, so me, I'm a CPA and I'm working, I'm basically partnered with a platform that makes things, that lets you do all this stuff. Um, but it really is bringing that power back into your hands. Now, an attorney, they have the software, but it's in their office and the the attorney's controlling all of that. With the software platform I'm working with, you get to basically, you know, it's online. You'll have literally something you can log into and you can make changes. In that last step, basically, by the way, after we fund the trust and we're meeting with the family, I'm literally handing the keys off to you guys. So if you're creating that trust, you'll be able to actually make changes to that trust document. You could do it by yourself, or if you want help, I'm there, you know, for life, for the whole, you know, you can basically contact me um, to help you through this at any time. So you're managing those estate documents. So all of those, like, seven documents I was talking about, the... Uh, the trust itself, the certificate of trust, you can basically generate, if you need to make any changes in them, you can update them. And it's literally uh, a decision tree software. It makes it super easy and it puts that control in your hands. Um, and you can make those changes all throughout your life. And it's putting all those things in a central place. And here's really one of the nicest aspects. Now, um, CPAs have software for tracking their um, if you're if you have different assets like real estate or something like that uh, if you have a lot of farm equipment you're tracking the, we, we use a tracking software to you know track assets for depreciation purposes for you know let's say you're adding uh, improvements and stuff to properties well you want to track all that so you can get the depreciation on that for tax purposes but the beauty of this platform is they're putting in this awesome central place to track all of your assets and not just assets, but you can put all your bank, all your account info in your utility account, your internet account, all whatever, like a different accounts. Like, just think about it. Someone passes away. You got a house. You want to upkeep all those things that are associated with that house, all those accounts you can put all this in a central place. And so normally when you go to an attorney, they're giving you, you know, a little, a nice folder, but you're, and you're getting a paper file and that you're sticking that accordion file somewhere. And it's, uh, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's a paper file. And if you ever got to get them changed, you got to go back to them and you're giving it this thing. This is let, literally giving you a central place where anyone could log in. So all the people in the family, if there's ever, you know, when that moment of death happens, it's it's crazy. It's hectic. It's stressful. And you might not know. Some people are better organized than others. Some people are really good at organization. Some people are terrible. And if you're terrible or if you're really organized, it could still be stressful. 
And it's great if you, everyone knows, hey, this is the central place we can log in to get all those documents. It has all the info about all their accounts and everything. And you could just add to this over time. You make this one your 30, 40, 50. You can add and track your documents in here for life. You can keep adding to that. You can just, if you get a new car, you get rid of a car. You're on all of your different stuff. Let's say you have a lot of sentimental stuff and you want to be really detailed about who gets what. Uh, you could also name, by the way, beneficiaries can be charities, charitable organizations. If you want to give stuff to the charitable organizations, donate a vehicle, donate whatever. You can do all that here. And so anyways, um, it's really, really good. All right, questions and answers. It's, let's see how much time. I'm, we're a little bit over, but I really appreciate um, all of you guys sticking through this. Let me just open everything up. Um, for everyone here. Let me see. Let me see if I can just do it myself. All right. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, oh, here we go. Stop share. All right. Do you guys... Um, wait, let me just change my view. Okay, great. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Let's see. Is um, are you here? limited to this... To Virginia, or can you work with people in other states? No, I could I could work with anyone in any state, okay. um, anywhere. Yeah, all of this stuff. The beauty of the software is it has you just um will whatever jurisdiction you're in, your county, your state, uh, it's all very similar, and you can get it custom made to however you're doing it. And same with the deed stuff, uh, and same yeah. with the type. You got to understand every state's a little bit different. Some states, um, just in case you're wondering, um, some states don't let you put the trust in the title itself. But what you can do is you can write this letter of intention that you're giving to the insurance companies and all the sort of important parties there. And it's allowing you to essentially, um, some states don't require, you know, just don't have that option. And so, yes, it, it essentially lets you um, do everything according to your state here. And uh, how can we find out more? Um, and I do have to hop off in a second if I'd like to talk more with yeah, you. Yeah, no about problem. What, what I'll do is I'll I have I have everyone's email and stuff. I'm going to shoot you um, just my information if you want. Um, if you want to know more, you can just I'll give you my phone number and my email. And uh, if you're interested in setting one up, the cost of these, by the way, the software I don't set the price of any of this stuff. The platform really does all of that. But it costs basically um, just under two thousand dollars, one ninety nine, one nine nine five, one thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars, and um, that's basically the cost of that. And um, and I don't really set any of that, but that's uh, in case okay. you're curious about that. And um, I think there's one. There's basically like a twenty five dollar a year fee a year mm -hmm. to basically for all the asset management stuff. Basically, to just keep an account with through the platform, um, it's like twenty five dollars for the year, and it lets you basically make unlimited changes for your whole life, and do the whole asset tracker, and everything's all in a central place. And if you ever are up late and changing these documents, by the way, you're basically getting them renotarized and then scanning them and then re-uploading them. And what's cool is it also has a version history thing too. So if anyone ever tries to contest any of this in court, if there's ever like family infighting or something, you'll have the entire record of all the changes. So anyways, uh, any other questions, Scott, Kathy? No, no thank you. Okay, cool. Well, I'll send you that info. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining and just uh, being here. And um, please reach out to me. I'm in the area. Scott, if you're in the area, I'm happy to do this in person and, you know, meet folks uh, and, uh, you know, be there when you're notarizing things. It's really best if the person who's setting all this up uh, or helping you through it can meet, you know, the, the different people involved. But I am local. I'm right down the road and I'm happy to, you know, uh, meet you guys. Sure. In person. And, you know, you guys yeah, can really come over. We could do this uh, at your house, at my house, either, you know, whatever you want to do. Or just call me if you have any more questions. We can go into um, 
I could just answer any questions you have and go into more detail. But yeah, yeah. Again, uh, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, just think about this, sleep on this. If other yeah. questions come up, you know, just uh, let me know. Uh, but yep. I'm glad to share this information and uh, you guys have an amazing evening and uh, thanks again. Thank you. You too. All right. Take care, guys.